Hello everyone, Resonance here, and welcome to Empires Apart! Empires Apart is a new, old-school, classic-style RTS game with a few twists, but on a modern engine, and it is now purchasable on Steam. During this video series, I'll be going over each of the six completely different civilizations in the game. As always, I appreciate your support, and you can find the full playlist below. But before I talk about the Chinese in this video, let me first give you a brief introduction to the game. To keep it simple, Empires Apart has the classic four-resource system economy, with the ability to micromanage your villagers, construct buildings wherever you want, and it follows the overall gameplay formula that you'd expect, but with a better random map balance and more complicated unit designs. As core though, Empires Apart definitely has its own identity, because of the many interesting twists and additions it brings. And remember, every civilization in Empires Apart is COMPLETELY different from the others. And so, let's talk a little bit about the Chinese. So the Chinese are classified as an advanced and protection-oriented civilization, with an emphasis on strong archers and utility. In the early game, as a release, the Chinese have a weaker but noticeably cheaper basic infantry unit, which gives players a very interesting option to experiment with or defend against with opposing fast rushes. While the Chinese might lack a strong early game, they more than make up for it with their unique economy system that allows them to advance to either technology level very quickly, and also through their devastating arsenal of special mechanics. As the Chinese, you want to be thinking about reaching military or economy level 1 faster than your opponents to gain a technology, economy, and unit type advantage while generally making sure that you're also utilizing your many powerful crossbow type units as part of your overall army. Once you reach the late stages of the game, this is when the Chinese gain full access to all of their many unique civilization mechanics that make them such a brilliant teammate or solo civilization. Much like the Arabs, the Chinese have multiple unique mechanics. But first, let's start with their unique economy. The Chinese don't have any of the standard economy upgrades that 4 out of 6 release civilizations have, but instead they must rely on their unique Overseer building ability. At any storage building or town center, you can toggle on and off an Overseer ability that when active, villagers who drop off resources at the active building will deposit 20% additional resources from whatever quantity that they were holding, but also lose 5 health each time they drop off. In general, only activate Overseer in bursts before the late game, and I expect these strategies to evolve over time. For example, to get to military level 1 for fast rushes, leave Overseer off at your town center until you've lured a wild boar there with your starting scout cavalry. Then enable Overseer for the duration of the boar for a huge spike in food, because villagers hold more food when hunting. After the second boar expires, Disable Overseer and get to military level 1 very quickly to rush your opponents down with scouts or crossbowmen while defending yourself with spearmen, crossbows, and towers if necessary, as Overseer can leave your villagers vulnerable to raiding. If you want to go the early fast economy route, simply temporarily enable the Overseer ability at one of your storage pits near the trees, but keep a close eye on any low health villagers, and thankfully all civs get an extra 20 villager HP in economy level 1. In addition, economy level 1 is especially important to the Chinese as it gives them access to their unique priest slash monk unit Then, in the early patches, after 5 seconds of standing still, the Chinese priest will begin meditating to heal nearby friendly units in a much wider range than the Arab's medic. This can be used to combo with Overseer by stationing priests on defensive stands near your activated drop off buildings. To keep your villagers healthy, and also since the Chinese priest can help fight back as an infantry unit. Just keep an eye on your villager HP always. And don't forget to build an early second town center and gather relics with your priests. If you suffer from a chronic resource deficiency, then ask your doctor if Overseer is right for you. Be sure to only use Overseer as prescribed, unless you have a certified healthcare professional nearby, like this Shaolin monk. This message is brought to you by Gul'dan, who this time only requests 5 HP in return at every resource drop-off. The Chinese are a civilization of duality and powerful trade-offs, and that certainly includes their two hero units, Zhu Zhe Liang and Yu Fei. In Empires Apart, every civilization gets to pick one of two heroes before the game starts, and they each represent two halves of the Chinese playstyle. When your hero dies, currently as a release, it is permanently dead and not put on a cooldown, 
and with the resurrecting fee, like in Warcraft 3. So all heroes are powerful late game units, with a single active ability on a cooldown and a passive ability as well. Liang has the active ability to summon his personal guard, as a release, a small army of four Chukonus, which are the same secondary rapid fire crossbowman unit that you can build at the archery range. While his active ability is on cooldown, Liang's passive ability changes, and as a release, it currently grants nearby Chukonu plus 2 damage, 50% bonus attack speed, and most importantly, plus 2 range. This really represents the duality side of the Chinese civilization. Because if Liang's active ability isn't on cooldown, his passive ability changes from a military bonus to an economy aura that makes nearby buildings with Overseer activated grant double the bonus resources, which as of this recording is 20% to 40%. Liang's passive ability combined with Overseer and enough priests late game allow the Chinese to outlast their opponents and really helps make up for their complete lack of standard economic technologies. So Liang is the type of hero that you should pick if you favor a more adaptable and reactive approach that involves having an incredibly efficient economy and the ability to protect yourself with long range, rapid fire crossbowmen. Next up we have Yu Fei, who is a mounted warrior with the active ability called Chopping. As of the early patches, Chopping targets a very close enemy unit and deals 20 damage to it and all enemies in front of Yu Fei in a small cone shaped radius as well as slowing them all heavily by 50% for 5 seconds. Since Fei is mounted, this allows you to chase down your opponent's army easily with your cavalry or snipe off any escaping enemies with your ranged units. To continue applying pressure, Yu Fei's passive is that when he dies for the first time, he doesn't. Instead, he just casually dismounts from his horse and decides to literally walk it off, gaining a second chance to fight again as an infantry unit with the same strong ability but overall weaker stats, notably including a movement speed drop from 360 to 240 and lower HP and armor. While this passive is powerful, Faye's now poor mobility makes chopping much more difficult to utilize effectively, but still serves as a way to improve Faye's presence in the battlefield, making it one prolonged battle that you certainly won't want to be trapped in by that lingering slow. Try to keep Yufei mounted by healing him with priests between fights, or sometimes he just evaporates. Yufei is definitely the type of hero that you should pick if you favor a more aggressive playstyle and want to win through a direct engagement rather than through a war of attrition like Liang. To wrap things up, we've already covered the Chinese Unique Priest unit, but I haven't mentioned the Chinese Siege Workshop as it contains both a Grenadier unit in Military Level 2 that deals splash damage and is a great anti-archer unit, and the Engineer, which cannot fight back, but instead it can construct siege buildings that villagers cannot and it can even transform itself into siege weapons like a trebuchet, ram, or flamethrower for some excellent line damage. The engineer can also construct minefields, which are actually visible to the enemy if you look really closely, and they detonate when stepped on by enemy units. This immediately damages and slows enemy units that are on top of it or within a half tile radius as a release. Place them within choke points or lure enemy units into them to win fights. The final thing that the engineer can construct is a fire pit, which is one of the many elements that makes the civilizations like the Chinese and the Arabs such great teammates. In that the Chinese fire pit grants nearby friendly ranged units currently plus 10 bonus damage against buildings. This combos very well with their wide assortment of different powerful ranged crossbowmen and their fortress unit, which is a sniper with a very long range and a long minimum range, but very powerful slow attack that can be used to pick off heroes and siege weapons with ease. The engineer also represents duality in that, while very flexible and useful, it means that the Chinese have a much slower siege push as their engineer must wait to construct equipment or wait to transform into siege weapons. And so, the goal of the Chinese is to try and get to either military or economy level 1 early and take advantage of your broad arsenal of excellent ranged and utility units. The Chinese really shine through their many different types of ranged units as a strong backline to their decent frontline of spearmen and cavalry. If you like a very utility oriented civilization with powerful long range units, burst damage, rapid fire, area of effect damage, snipers, and a very flexible playstyle overall, then you'll definitely like playing as the Chinese in Empires Apart. And that's all for this civilization overview, but don't forget to check out the full playlist in the video description below, or at the very end of this video, 
with the remaining three episodes coming out in April. My personal thanks to everyone for watching and supporting the channel, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video, or on my social media, and the next Twitch stream.